This sequence of videos is going to begin the discussion of forces within the context of two-dimensional motion. So we've already talked a little bit about forces of objects on ramps, but in those situations you can actually simplify it down to a one-dimensional motion problem. These problems are inherently two-dimensional and there's nothing we can do to make them be one-dimensional. Now this first uh, sequence of videos related to section 8.1 uh, is going to be fairly short compared to the later ones and it's going to set up some really basic ideas that then uh, later videos are going to build upon and we'll get into some more uh, complicated, some more interesting material there. So the goal today in this, in this video is to use Newton's second law in two dimensions and that is not going to be particularly challenging. We are then going to think about forces and how they impact speed and direction and again a lot of this is going to relate back to when we did two-dimensional acceleration. Obviously there's going to be a bit of a parallel. So there are three learning outcomes that we are touching on. The first is representation. It is always important to define your coordinate system and your direction, what is x, what is y, and that's going to be more so here. So it's important then when you're doing your free body diagrams, when you're drawing sketches, pictures of your situation, if you're doing motion diagrams, that especially in two dimensions you must define what your coordinate uh, system is, what are your directions. Uh, next, there's a little bit of problem solving here but we're really just touching on it and in particular we're going to talk about one situation that isn't actually solv solvable at this level. So we're going to introduce a little bit of it um, but not really dive in since it's quickly uh, impossible. And then lastly uh, communicating. Again it's really important that you're careful with how you are representing vectors and how you are representing vector components and that's again going to be more so true here where we have to worry about two different dimensions. So let's jump into it. 2D dynamics. So I like this little book summary um, because it is oh so simple. Are Newton's laws different in two dimensions? No. Now honestly uh, we could just stop the whole chapter right there. We could just say we're done but obviously we have a lot to deal with and a lot to understand. So when we first introduced Newton's law such as Newton's second law we said that f net equals ma and we wrote it as vectors. And so because of that, because they're vectors, we can anticipate that this is going to work as a two-dimensional vector or even as a three-dimensional vector. So one of the things we're going to think about is that if you have a trajectory where you have your instantaneous velocity vector, that your force is going to change the direction and the speed. So we're going to think about that. But the big thing is that when we introduce Newton's law, specifically the second law, we already wrote it in a vector notation. So that's where we can move it to two dimensions without any difficulty whatsoever. So I'd like to talk through one example of where this is going to come in. And the situation is that you have a rocket that has a thrust force in the y direction and that there's a wind in the x direction. So now there's a couple of things to note about this. That initially we have just uh, two positions here, but we haven't actually drawn what the trajectory is between the two of them. Uh, next, we have a whole lot of these knowns, and I'd like to highlight one thing, that here where you have this uh, thrust vector and then the wind vector, there's no vector symbol here, right? So it's just the force of thrust, force of wind. These are magnitudes. So this is only a magnitude. If I wanted to write it as a vector, I would need to specify its direction. Now, sometimes if we're in a one-dimensional problem, we use a sign, just a positive or a negative, to denote it. But now that we're in two-dimensional problems, it's really important to write it explicitly. So if I wanted to write the force of the thrust as a vector, that's going to be my 1500 newtons and I need to give it a direction. That's in the up direction so that's my positive y hat and in the case of the wind again it's really important to note that now this is a vector so this is 20 newtons in the positive x hat direction. 
Now you might say, Dr. Ackerman, how would we know that? Well again, this is an example from the book, so I'm using some information that was in the book that I didn't just put on the slide, but that's actually an important thing. That if you didn't have this picture and you just wrote this down, I would have no idea what direction they're in. So it's really important that you always put that down initially, that you could draw on your picture here, that you have your uh, thrust, so thrust, is in the positive y direction and in the case of this deflection this is actually going to be your xf minus xi like this deflection is actually a distance so be really careful that you're labeling the things you mean to like this is the wind and not the thrust okay so you could put those on these, this picture, but again, anytime you write it down, be very careful whether you're trying to communicate a magnitude, whether you're trying to communicate a vector. Vectors have directions. So lastly, let's go over and look at our free body diagram. We have three forces acting on our rocket. The thrust and the wind we already talked about, and then the last is gravity. You know that there's a gravitational force because this rocket is somewhere on Earth. Um, how do you know that? Well, there's not wind in space. So that's one way to think about this. Um, so why is this thrust vector bigger than the wind? Well, if you look, the thrust force is in fact much, much bigger than the wind. So I would say that the ratio here should be even bigger. Now, obviously you're not going to always be drawing these to scale, but do try to take into account that you know initially that your thrust vector is bigger. So actually make it bigger. Now, the next thing you know is that there is a net force in the y direction because it is accelerating upwards. So that means your thrust should be bigger than your gravitational force. But we also know there's nothing balancing out the force of the wind deflecting it sideways. So if we wanted to draw our F net, what would that look like? Well, F net is somewhat in the y direction and somewhat in the x direction. It's at an angle. And so where that's coming from, and this would then not actually be part of your free body diagram, but something you would do separately, is that you would say that, oh, I have a, this is my F net, it's a magnitude, and then I have F net in the Y direction, F net in the X direction. I use commas in my subscript, the book sometimes uses parentheses and then puts an additional component subscript outside of it. But so you can see from this that your F net in the X direction is just F wind. F net in the Y direction is equal to the magnitude of your thrust minus the magnitude of gravity. Now why this matters is that, and I'm going to clear all of this just so I have a little more space to write, once we start to talk about our acceleration, our acceleration in the x direction is equal to the net force in the x direction divided by the mass. Our acceleration in the y direction is equal to the net force in the y direction divided by the mass. So be careful that it's not just F net, it's F net in that direction. And so in this case, you would use your free body diagram to find what your net force is in the X direction and what your net force is in the Y direction. So you wouldn't actually need to use your overall net force, but you would use what your X and Y components of it actually are. So please be careful about this. And when you are drawing a F net vector on your free body diagram, don't draw two vectors and call them both F net. Like you have one net force and it has both an X and a Y component. So this is the simplest type of two-dimensional force problem where you just have a, a net force in two dimensions that you can break up in terms of X and Y. So you're going to see this occasionally, but we're going to be spending most of our time on much more complicated situations in two dimensions. This here is actually a picture from, I think, chapter four when we talked about two-dimensional motion. We talked about the idea that if you have an instantaneous acceleration vector in two dimensions, right, this is an x-y trajectory plot, and an instantaneous velocity vector, that you can break your acceleration into a perpendicular component and a parallel component. The parallel component changes speed, the perpendicular component changes direction. Now, we know from Newton's second law that F net is going to be the same direction as our acceleration. Why? Because F net and acceleration are both vectors, mass is a scalar, so these two must have the same direction for this equation to be true.
So what that means is we can think about the components of F net as having the same influence as the components of A. So our F net in the perpendicular direction, where here we specifically mean perpendicular to the velocity, this changes the direction. And if we instead have, or in addition to, have an F net in the parallel direction, again parallel to the velocity vector, this changes the speed. So one thing to think about is that when we worked with blocks on ramps or objects on ramps in general, that it still simplified down to a one-dimensional problem where your velocity was parallel to the ramp and your net force was parallel to the ramp. Therefore, we only had to worry about changes in speed. It never changed direction. So now we're going to see net forces that are perpendicular to how it's moving, or at least components of the net force that are perpendicular, and that's going to be changing the direction. So a really simple practice here. I have a velocity vector and I have a force. Now let's specifically call this, let's improve upon this a little bit, and say that this is my net force. Because if it was only one force, we would need to know what the other forces are. If this is the only force, then that one force is equal to the net force. So the question is then, how do we break this into components that are perpendicular and parallel to velocity to understand how it changes the speed of this particle and the direction of its velocity vector? Well, we see that there's going to be, and I'm, I guess I'm using this as my my point here, it's always confusing with these book vectors, that this is your F net perpendicular to velocity. And in this, I've drawn the direction, so it is technically a vector. And this here then is your F net parallel. So we see that the parallel component is actually anti-parallel to the velocity vector. It's going the other direction. So this is going to be slowing the particle down and it's going to be turning the velocity in the down direction. So let's actually draw a coordinate system so I can talk about that more intelligently. So my next velocity is actually going to be a little bit smaller and it's going to be in the uh, a little more in the negative y direction. So if I draw a new velocity vector and I call it v2 because it's the one after v1, it looks a little more like that. So again, this is the exact same analysis that we did for acceleration, and the reason we get to do that is because mass just serves as a proportionality constant without impacting the direction.